I'm uh, very happy to be here and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, even wherever you are. So uh, my name is uh, Maurice van Tegelen in Dutch or uh, Maurice van Tegelen in French uh, or uh, Maurice van Tegelen in English. And um, I'm uh, actually working uh, at uh, Utrecht University. And as you can have guessed, I'm, um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about turbulence on the Greenland ice sheet. But first, maybe a few words about who I am. Well, basically, I grew up uh, in the French Alps in Grenoble. And I've been living there until uh, 2015, where I did the Bachelor in Physics. And um, well, actually, then I moved to the Netherlands, where my roots are a bit, because my parents are Dutch. And now I'm doing my PhD at Utrecht, Utrecht University, together with Paul Smeets, Caroline Tijmreimer, and uh, Michiel van den Broeke. And as you can see on these pictures, you get a really different view of the cryosphere uh, in France, in French Alps. You, you really have these big glaciers and a lot of snow. And in the Netherlands, it's all flat. But if you're lucky, uh, you can uh, do some ice skating every, uh, every now and then. So it's really different. Nice to see how different it is. Um, and actually, in the Netherlands, it was a big day today because we had the national elections today. In the Netherlands, when you start talking about uh, elections, of course, a lot of topics in politics. but this year, climate was, a, was an important uh, topic. And in the Netherlands, when you start talking about uh, climate, of course, you start talking about sea level rise because the country being so, so flat and so vulnerable to sea level rise. And if you start talking about sea level rise, well, you, you are going to start to talk about mass balance of the Greenland ice sheet and of the Antarctic ice sheets. And this is where I want to bring you during this talk. So I'm going to bring you to the Greenland ice sheet, where I've been putting here on this map all the places where there are weather stations on the ice sheet. Most of these places are um, from the Promise network or from GCNet. And uh, some of these uh, places, mostly in the K transect here and also in the Q transect itself, we also at EMO uh, operating some weather stations. And here I've been showing here on the right side some very cool drone pictures. Um, from the top side is the K transect, and the south side is from the Q transect. And you can already see how rough the surface is. Unfortunately, you cannot see the turbulence, but if you would be seeing turbulence, it would be a mess everywhere. So these drones are very nice, but why do we uh, bring these drones in the field? Well, there's the one reason is why we bring the drones is really to map the elevation. So for instance, here, I'm uh, looking at the elevation um, from, from, from a drone, actually, around the weather station, S5, in the ablation area of the, um, of the Greenland ice sheet. And you can already see how, how variable, how, how, how rough the surface is. I mean, if you would be standing here at this weather station, you would be looking towards the east, you would be seeing all these, these bumps and these, these, yeah, these, these the ice hummocks. And you can all nicely see here these melt channels in the data. So it's very rough. And the funny thing is if you look in another direction, it looks different. It's also very rough. And actually, it's, it's much rougher in this direction. You still see these melt channels, some ice hummocks. And if you would be looking to the south, it's even, it's also different. It's a bit less rough, but still rougher than the blue line. Funny thing, you can also see here the, the side of a moulin here. Very cool to see. Uh, we didn't map the whole moulin because of time issues. And, but, well, um, it's very cool data. But why we are, are, we are really there is, of course, to measure the um, mass balance of the Greenland ice sheet, the surface mass balance. So we've been measuring the melt there since actually this early 90s, but here I've been showing daily ice ablation measurements in watts per square meter until from 2017 to 2019. And um, what you can already see is that, um, well, the melt, of course, happens only in the summer. Uh, and well, at least the ice ablation does. And 2019 was actually a big melting year, so you can already kind of see that it's a bit longer melt season than the other two years and also a bit more melt. And why that is, well, we can answer that question because we also measure all the other components of the surface energy balance. Um, so for instance, here I'm showing daily average net shortwave radiation, but also the net uh, longwave thermal radiation in red, which is mostly negative, of course. And then on the bottom part is really what I'm really looking at. It's really turbulent heat fluxes. And these are things that are actually very tricky to measure, but here we have gathered three years of measurements at this site here. And you can already see that the sensible heat flux, so really the temperature flux, so really the, 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 the transport of uh, air, of warm air towards the surface from convection or from turbulence is actually very important and year round. And 
if you zoom in a little bit, so for instance, if you look really at the before the uh, melt season here, you can already see that there's every year there's like this negative peak in latent heat flux, so in moisture flux. And this is in fact sublimation. Every year it happens before the melting season and it's really driven by the sensible heat flux um, because during this uh, period, early May, um, before the melting season, the, uh, the air is uh, getting warmer, but the surface is still very cold. So you got really warm air coming towards the surface and that energy must go somewhere and it's being used to actually uh, sublimate some snow. And that can have a lot of impacts, of course, on when the melting season starts. Um, but if you would be looking uh, more and deeper in, um, in the ablation season, uh, really during uh, in August, for instance, you can see that these peaks in ice ablation that you have every year, you have these extreme melt events. And these are really caused when, happen really when you have a combination of both very high uh, radiative fluxes, but also very high sensible heat flux and latent heat flux. What happens is that you're in the middle of the summer, so you have a lot of sun, but it's also getting warmer, so a, lot, a, lot of sensible heat, a large sensible heat flux and also a large latent heat flux. Both of them combined cause a lot of melt. And we know that since the 90s because these measurements are not, we have been doing these measurements for a long time already, but it's still cool to see that in the data, I think. So now you must be like, okay, but where, where's the problem then, I mean? We know everything, we know the energy balance, there's no problem, right? Well, actually there's a problem. Well, the first problem is of course that it's actually tricky to measure these uh, turbulent heat fluxes, but we kind of solved that problem already with a paper published last year that you can actually apply some simple methods to calculate sensible heat fluxes. But the second bigger problem is that actually when occurs when you start to model these sensible heat fluxes. So here I've been finding, uh, I've been gathering a very old, uh, well, old, not that old, but 1986, I would say. It's a very interesting um, plot where you can actually, by hand, calculating, calculate the sensible heat flux. So if you know the temperature and you know how high you are, so for instance, um, <clears throat> it's five degrees uh, and you are in the, in, the uh, <clears throat> in the ablation area, so 500 meters, you could draw a line, then you need to know the wind speed. So I think you draw a bit more the line towards here and then you fin finalize the line and you can see that already only the sensible heat flux would cause almost 20 millimeters of uh, water equivalent of melt per day. So this is very nice and really stresses out that we know how to calculate sensible heat fluxes for a long time already. So that's not really the problem. The problem is that we need a value for the roughness that I'm here, this here. And it's actually used here 0.2 centimeters. But if you change this value, which has been shown by uh, Roger Brethwaite, actually 1995, very nice paper, is that if you multiply by 10 the roughness, which is completely normal on a glacier, because I will show it later, is you can actually double the sensible heat flux. So it has a huge effect. If you just double the, uh, multiply by 10 the roughness, you almost double the sensible heat flux. If you would using, for instance, at temperature five degrees, typical in summer in the green ice sheet on the ablation area. So um, <clears throat> what's the problem then? It's that we don't really know what the roughness is. I mean, we have a few observations uh, that are gathered here in this paper from 2016, where we have, uh, measurements from the aerodynamic roughness set zero. And uh, it actually is very variable. I mean, most of you know that of course, is that if you're very high on a glacier and equilibrium zone, uh, far above the equilibrium zone area line, I mean, then the surface is very smooth and you have snow and it like you can see on this picture, very nice picture is that it's very, very smooth. I mean, it's, it's called, this is like typical values of 10 to the minus five uh, millimeters. But if you actually move towards the, um, the, um, the ice edge, it gets rougher and rougher. So here at S6, you've got ice hummocks that are already almost one meter high because of roughness of almost uh, one centimeter. And then if you move even further away, close to the ice edge, at some, pump, some point the bumps get really big and you even have big crevasses, it gets really rough. So this is uh, something that we need to model. And this brings me actually to the holy grail which is how to convert topography to uh, aerodynamic roughness. And this is actually one of the biggest problems in physics and in engineering, because we don't know how to solve uh, the Navier-Stokes equations analytically. So you have to use big computers 
to calculate every single eddy that's turning around all these bumps, we are not going to able to do that on a green ice sheet. So we're using block drag model, which worked quite well to convert, for instance, here elevation that we measure with a drone to really aerodynamic roughness. So we tried that for S5. And it turns out that if you do that, you find that the roughness depends also on the wind direction because, well, as I said, if you look more to the south, it gets rougher. And the very cool thing is that's actually also something you could see from the measurements. So in the measurements, if you look at the roughness as a function of wind direction, it gets rougher in the south. And now we know why. It's just because um, these bumps, these ice hummocks, are also rougher in the south. That's actually very cool because you now can model something that is really hard to model so far. Of course, we're not the only ones to do this. I mean, there are a lot of uh, people doing this, depending on which build Dragon model you model you're using, which data you're using. I've summarized it here, but uh, I'm not going into detail. I mean, for people that are interested, they can look at it. Of course, these are not all the references. There are, pro there are probably a lot that I missed. I will be, I'm happy to, uh, to have a discussion with you guys about it. But anyway, what we did, we applied this model from 1992 to ISAT2 data. This is really what we published that while we trying to publish in the, uh, the cryosphere. And actually, if you look at the ISAT2 data, which was a uh, satellite which was launched, launched a few years ago by NASA, it's a whole bunch of uh, photons in height as function of distance. And if you look here at this area here on the K-transect, you already see that it's, it's very, very, uh, very, you, you can already see a little bit of topography. So what we did, we just, we found a method to extract a one meter resolution line out of this data. And if you would compare this to a drone elevation, if you bring a drone, you go there, you have to launch a drone, everything, you almost don't see the difference with a UAV elevation. So it's incredible. You can just model, you can just from your desk or from your couch, see every single bump on the green and ice sheet, every single ice summer. So it's actually pretty cool stuff. And if you extrapolate that, well, then you can calculate the roughness everywhere because the satellite is just scanning the whole green and ice sheet every time, every, all the time. So then you can just make a map of the aerodynamic roughness. So this is what we did. And it turns out that the roughness is extremely variable. I mean, of course, very crevassed areas are very rough and some ice hummocks are also rough and higher up, it's getting smoother. There's a lot of information in here. If you are interested, I, I added here a QR code uh, to uh, our cryosphere discussion paper. So feel free to, uh, to uh, check it out. Um, but uh, this brings me actually to my uh, to the conclusions. Um, I, and it's, yeah, it's really you can really see how how these ice dynamics also affect the roughness. I mean, this is this is really cool to see the crevasse here. Very and actually S five here is where we uh, these pictures where we've shown have been, have been showing A here is where we have been doing A and B is where we've been doing drone measurements. So, well, cool stuff. All right. So my conclusions are that. Um, melt, uh, as you probably know, is enhanced by turbulent heat fluxes. And the problem is, well, it's not really a problem, it's a, it's a fact, it's that turbulent heat fluxes increase with surface roughness. I mean, if you're driving a car very fast on a highway, it starts going all directions, the same on the ice sheet. If the wind starts flowing very fast, in the, which is the case of the ice sheet with catabatic winds, then uh, turbulent heat flux are increased. And now really the nice thing now is that we can map how rough the ice sheet is from space. So uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, write them down in the chat or drop me an email and I will be happy to answer them. Thanks. Perfect, thank you, Maurice. Um, I, it might be worth to uh, put a link to your paper in the chat as well, in case people are interested in reading that. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, next one up will be uh, Lynn, and she is a final year PhD student at University of sorry, I lost my notes. Um, University of Maine, um, and she's currently a visiting scholar at University of Alaska Fair, Fairbanks. Um, and the work she's presenting today will be submitted to the upcoming special issue in the Frontiers in Earth Science on Ice Sheet. I see sheer margins in warming climate. Over to you, Lynn. Great, thank you very much. Um, 
Great. Um, so today I'll be talking about some of the modeling work uh, I've been doing on Ross Eye Shelf sensitivity to changes along the Western lateral margin. Um, all of this work has been done using um, the eye sheet system model um, developed at Caltech. Um, and some of the results that I'm presenting today aren't quite finalized. Um, so I'm open to comments and questions at the end of the seminar. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so to begin, over 70% of the Antarctic ice sheet drains into the floating ice shelves. Um, so understanding controls on ice shelf stability is critical in order to predict the future evolution of the ice sheet. Um, while there are several controls on uh, ice shelf stability, lateral shear margins in particular are important regions within ice shelves as um, ice shelf flow is primarily restrained by drag in these regions um, because there's no um, resistance underneath the ice shelf. Um, and therefore, these regions represent a critical, critical control on ice shelf mass balance. Um, lateral shear zone destabilization often follows a pattern uh, where initial submarine melt-driven thinning increases uh, the ice shelf susceptibility to fracture and crevassing. This reduces the load-bearing surface area and lateral drag provided um, by the lateral margin and ultimately results in a loss of buttressing at the grounding line. Um, the work that I'm presenting on today focuses on the Ross Eye Shelf. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief introduction on larger, uh, uh, the large scale Ross Eye Shelf dynamics. Many of you may be aware of several recent studies um, over the last um, few years um, exploring buttressing uh, potential um, of Antarctic ice shelves. One paper I'd like to highlight in particular is the Reset All paper. Um, they coined a term called um, telebuttressing, which is the idea that localized ice shelf thinning can accelerate ice flow in regions far from that initial perturbation. So the figure on the left is from uh, that recent paper, um, and it shows the maximum response distance for uh, a model perturbation of a meter thinning applied to a 20 by 20 kilometer grid cell. Um, and they uh, highlight this western lateral margin as a particularly sensitive area to thinning. So if we look at this, um, we can see moderate thinning along this margin can have um, implications up to 1,000 kilometers um, from that initial perturbation. Um, in addition, a lot of exciting work has come out of the Rosetta project over the last year um, in terms of observations and studies of the Ross Eye Shelf sensitivity to basal melt as well as other forcings. Um, on the left is a figure from Tinto et al. in 2020. Um, this is showing summer, summer basal melt rates um, from an ocean circulation model. And uh, again, it's sort of highlighting this western lateral margin where there are um, summer melt rates of up to 10 meters a year. This is only over the summer, um, but other uh, recent work has sort of put this um, estimate um, around um, two meters per year. So if we combine uh, these recent observational uh, works with the modeling work, um, the implication is that the Western model margin is a key area of vulnerability for the Ross Eye Shelf. So not only are, pre are we predicting that a moderate thinning in this region could have um, far field uh, effects, but our estimates from our observations are, are comparable to the um, scenarios in those studies. And I found um, these findings particularly interesting because my colleagues and I have been traveling to the Western lateral margin over several field seasons. We've been studying an area called the McMurdo Shear Zone, which is a five to 10 kilometer wide zone of intense crevassing. Um, and it's located between the boundary of the Ross Ice Shelf and the McMurdo Ice Shelf. And um, over many years, we've collected GPS and GPR data to study the structure and kinematics of the region. Um, we've done this collaboratively with the um, Thayer School of Engineering using their um, robotics to tow our equipment uh, safely back and forth across the shear zone. So one important finding that's come out of the work is the evidence for basal marine ice. 
Um, so this top figure is a 200 megahertz transect, as shown by this black line here. Um, so it's a transect of 5.7 kilometers across the shear zone. Um, and we were able to pick up on a bright reflector of, at about 160 meters, which we interpret to be the transition between meteoric ice and basal marine ice that's frozen on underneath the ice shelf. And we were also able to penetrate another 10 meters into the marine ice layer uh, before we lost signal. Um, so we know the ice is at least 170 to 180 meters thick. Um, from our observations. Um, so using this information, we wanted to get a better estimate of ice thickness across the shear zone. Um, so we ended up using the surface elevation from uh, GPS observations, uh, as well as the location of uh, the meteoric ice transition um, and fern densities, as well as estimates of uh, basal marine ice densities. So we used two from literature. Um, as we um, believe it to be more dense than meteoric ice. And um, using that information, we estimate the ice thickness to be between 190 to 200 meters, or 220 meters thick. And um, we believe the marine ice layer to be about uh, 40 to 60 meters thick. So here's a comparison of our estimates with some widely used remote sensing data sets. Um, typically used for the large scale models. Um, the, top, the top line is BEDMAP2, which is the data set used in the modeling studies I've talked about so far. Um, and our estimates of ice thickness, all the way down here, are more than three times as thick um, as BEDMAP2's original observations or um, predictions. Um, and even our direct observations, uh, how far we were able to penetrate into the ice shelf are thicker than um, both Bed Machine and Rosetta. Um, so what does this discrepancy mean for sensitivity changes in this region? Um, the good news is that while we believe Rosetta and Bed Machine um, to still underestimate ice thickness, um, they are still far better than Bed Map 2. Um, they're still more than twice as thick. Um, so I decided to do um, a comparison study in ISSM utilizing uh, Ben Map 2 and Ben Machine data sets, uh, with the idea being that Ben Machine is closer to our observations. Um, I don't really have time to go into the methods too much, but I utilize the ice sheet system model um, to investigate various thinning scenarios. Um, and here is an example um, showing the solved velocity of the model domain from a simple stress balance solution. Um, and I ended up initializing two separate scenarios. Um, again, the first being Ben Map 2 um, ice thickness and the second using Ben Machine. Um, and then 20 by 20 kilometer portions of the domain. So if we look at plots of the initial thickness for the two scenarios, Ben Map 2 on the left and Ben Machine on the right, um, visualizing the model side by side doesn't really um, show too much of a difference. Um, but if we look at the difference in thickness, um, this is showing um, bed machine ice thickness minus bed map two. Um, we see a large, uh, large difference, uh, particularly in areas um, downstream of the grounding line, such as Bird. Um, and then if we zoom, in, zoom into our western low margin, um, we see that bed machine ice thickness is more than 100 meters thicker than the bed map two. Um, so for my initial model scenario, I ended up applying a two meter thinning across um, an initial 20 by 20 kilometer grid cell and then solved two separate stress balance solutions for each scenario. Um, so here are the results comparing the change in velocity magnitude due to the perturbation of two meter thinning. Um, again, then that two is on the left and then machine is on the right. Um, and as we would expect, then that two shows a greater change in velocity um, in response to the same perturbation. Um, and this is because it's thinner to begin with. So you're removing a greater portion of the ice shelf. Um, what is interesting though, um, is that both seem to have a similar um, distance associated with the velocity forcing. Um, so we're still seeing changes far from the initial perturbation um, for both of the scenarios. 
Um, after our initial stress balance simulation, I wanted to explore um, transient scenarios, uh, as well as explore some of this spatial sensitivity um, due to thinning. Um, I chose five different case studies uh, along the lateral margin and ended up running a 25 year transient solution for each case study. Um, and I did this solving for both stress balance and um, mass transport. Um, so I, I actually studied, um, solved it for the entire domain, so also um, solving for flux across the grounding line, even though that's not shown. So for each transient solution, we can compare the change in flux across the grounding line. Um, on the left, I have an illustration of each case study uh, in relation to um, the change in ice thickness between bed machine and bed map 2 scenarios. And then on the right, I have the um, change in flux over the 25 year time period. Um, and each graph um, uh, lines up vertically with its corresponding case study. Um, and bed map two results are represented with um, solid symbols, whereas the bed, bed machine results are shown by um, the symbol outlines. And similar to the initial uh, simple stress balance solution, um, Case studies two through five uh, show that the bed map two scenario is more sensitive to the same amount of thinning. Um, however, uh, case study one shows the opposite. Um, so this actually makes sense uh, if we look at um, the difference between the ice thickness spatially on the left. Um, we actually see that case study one um, bed machine is actually um, thinner to begin with than bed map two. Um, if we look more closely, we can see other patterns as well. For one, the difference in the change in flux for bed machine and bed mat 2 for each of the scenarios um, diverges over time. Um, but some scenarios, uh, such as case 5, uh, diverge more than others. Um, case 5 um, has the largest discrepancy, um, despite the fact that it seems to have the least amount of dis difference um, in the initial thickness between the bed map 2 and bed machine scenarios. Um, so this makes more sense if we look at the percent of thickness removed for each scenario. Um, on the left, we have the sum of the flux um, difference versus the percent of the ice shelf which is removed. And we see uh, a roughly um, linear relationship between the change in total flux and percent um, removed. For example, uh, case five uh, has about 2% of its original ice thickness removed um, and has the largest change in flux. Um, however, we can sort of see that this relationship isn't exactly linear and there's um, more to it. For example, um, the bed mat two scenario for case study four um, is also some, uh, almost 2% thinning, so similar to case study five, uh, but they have um, different, um, much different fluxes to begin with. Um, so one possible reason for this is that while I'm thinning the same amount of ice from each scenario, um, I'm thinning ice of a different rheology or ice hardness parameter. Um, the uh, initial inversion I use in the model is sensitive to initial um, ice thickness. So uh, the bed map two and bed machine scenarios have um, different ice hardness parameters to begin with. Um, so uh, I hope to sort of tease through this in future simulations. So to summarize, our GPR observations show that um, ice thickness is greatly underestimated in the bed map two data set, which has been widely used um, in, in most of the large scale modeling studies. By comparing um, models initialized by bed map 2 and bed machine, which is sort of a proxy to being closer to our ice thickness estimates, we know that um, stress balance and flux across the grounding line is particularly sensitive to um, how we initialize the thickness. And uh, the percent of thickness removed um, is a good indicator of how much flux you can expect um, to flow across the grounding line, but this doesn't cover the entire picture. Um, because the western lateral margin of the rice ice shelf is an area of vulnerability, better ice thickness estimates um, are really key to predicting the future evolution for the rice ice shelf in particular. 
Um, and on the larger scale, ice thickness estimates could greatly be improved um, by observations of marine ice location, um, its thickness, and particularly its density. Um, so with that, I'll just leave um, up my contact information for those who um, might be watching this after the fact. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, NSF um, for support. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to uh, the next person. Thank you, amazing, Lynn. I'm really excited to hear more about how the whole radar system works. So let's chat later about that. Um, next one up will be Riley Kohlberg. He is a PhD student at um, Stanford University. Stanford is part of the Stanford Radio Classiology Group. And uh, Riley uses airborne radar sounding um, to study fern hydrology and the structure and prim primarily um, on the Greenland ice sheet. Um, so over to you, Riley. Thanks, give me a moment to get this set back up properly. But yeah, thanks so much. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about some work that I've done looking at airborne radar sounding observations of um, some ice layers that formed in Greenland's fern following the extreme melt in the summer of 2012, and then, you know, what that might tell us uh, basically about the ice sheet's future response to surface melting. And this is some work that I've done with my advisor at Stanford, Dusty Schroeder, as well as Winnie Chu at Georgia Tech. Yeah, so as Maurice kind of already introduced, right, the Greenland ice sheet is right now a really major contributor to um, global sea level. And, you know, at least over the last decade, about 55% of that um, mass loss has really come from decreases in surface mass balance that are driven by increasing meltwater runoff. And so not surprisingly, you know, this comes with an even longer term trend of increasing, um, you know, total surface melt production, as well as an increase in the cumulative melt area on the ice sheet. Um, and so one of the results of that then is that there's quite a bit of surface melting that's actually happening above the equilibrium line um, in sort of the parts of the ice sheet where if we want to draw a connection between sort of surface melt production and actual surface mass loss, we have to know something about sort of the connecting fern hydrology. And of course, the reason for that is that, you know, in the accumulation zone, when we have the surface melt, it's going to first sort of percolate vertically down into the fern pack. And so where it does or doesn't go next, right, depends a lot sort of on the fern structure and on uh, kind of the reader general climate of that area. So, for example, you've got sort of the high accumulation, high melt southeast, um, where we see these perennial fern aquifers that have actual liquid water storage in the subsurface. Um, and that's very different from, for example, southwest Greenland, um, where we tend to see sort of this elevation driven gradient refreezing that's ranging all the way from these sort of thin isolated ice lenses up in the shallow percolation zone to massive multimeter thick ice slabs sitting just below the surface in the wet snow zone. And so of course, you know, this range of, of responses has really different implications for the ice sheet and its mass balance, right? On one hand, the fern might be acting as this really significant buffer that's actually going to delay the onset of runoff for, for quite a bit, even once surface melting starts. On the other hand, if we're continually forming these sort of perched low permeability horizons like the ice slabs, then actually that's going to drive the ice sheet towards runoff conditions much more rapidly. Um, and so I think this whole thing is actually super interesting because you know, like many things in glaciology is the sort of tyranny of scales where we need to know a lot of stuff about the very small sort of meter scale structures of the fur, but understand it at the scale of the ice sheet in order to really translate that in, into the questions of surface mass balance. Um, of course, the other interesting piece here is that, you know, the, these features are really sort of multi-annual things, um, but Greenland has also seen you know, quite a number of really record-breaking melt seasons since 2000, with uh, 2012 being sort of the quintessential example of that, where we've got at least one day where about 100% of the ice sheet surface um, was melting. And so for us, that really raised the question then of how does the, the fern respond to these, you know, much more transient but very extreme um, melt seasons like 2012? And, you know, certainly we've got a lot of fascinating evidence from the field that suggests this is something totally worth thinking about. Um, I'll point to just a few. And for example, the 2015 study by Del Peña and all, um, who had found um, pretty extensive near surface ice layers um, up to about 2,400 meters elevation in southwest Greenland that seemed to have formed just as a result of melt in 2010 and 2012. Um, and even if you look back at the very first um, paper out on the 2012 melt season from Gim et al., um, they're already pointing to ice layer formation to these very interior sites um, like Neem. Um, but of course, the, the struggle right, with field measurements is that we're getting sort of these point measurements in time and space at the few places where we're lucky enough to like have been able to do a field season. Um, and so when we're trying to understand sort of why these kinds of melt layers form, um, you know, and what, what they mean for the ice sheet on a larger scale, that, that gets tough. Um, 
And as you can probably guess, since I'm coming here from Stanford Radio Glaciology, uh, what, what we do then is turn to airborne radar sounding to see if we can get some sort of larger scale answers to some of these questions. Um, so we're going to look today at a bunch of sort of radar from the uh, accumulation radar um, flown as part of NASA's Operation Icebridge. Um, and we'll go for the moment to an example down here in Southwest Greenland. Um, this is up at actually about 2,700 meters elevation. And you know what we see in the radar prior to the big melt in 2012 is kind of exactly what we'd expect, which is this sort of nice um, subsurface layering that just comes from small differences in uh, you know, density between various accumulation events. But the data that we get after the 2012 melt season, um, you know, it starts to show this really bright secondary reflector below the surface that's often as bright, if not brighter than the surface return. And that reflector really persists um, through um, the last data that we have in um, April of 2017, except that it's now buried about five meters below the surface. And so for just sort of an off the cuff estimate here, for, for this reflector to be as bright as the surface return, that basically means that the density contrast between whatever this layer is and the background fern has to be about as large as the density contrast between the surface snow and air. So we're talking like 300 kilograms per meter cubed here. Um, and all of this together suggests that what we're looking at in these radar grams really is a, a pretty distinctive radar signature of um, sort of this subsurface um, refrozen melt layer that had formed following the extreme um, melt season of 2012. And so what we wanted to do was take all of this airborne radar data from the 2017 season um, and go through and map out both the spatial extent and lateral conductivity of this layer, as well as use the um, actual radar reflectivity with a little bit of um, fancy electromagnetic modeling to go ahead and constrain sort of what the density um, of this layer most likely is. And so it turns out that, you know, when we do this, um, this 2012 melt layer is pretty much pervasive across, you know, most of the Greenland ice sheet. We're seeing this in nearly every sector and in some places at elevations that are like 700 meters above, you know, where we've previously mapped ice slabs. Um, so what you're looking at here in, in panel A is the lateral connectivity. And you can think of this basically as just sort of the, um, the continuity of our detections of this layer from radar trace to radar trace. Um, and then in panel B, you're looking at sort of the absolute minimum density that would be consistent with the calibrated radar reflectivities that we're looking at. And we can combine both of these metrics into sort of a single overview metric that I'm gonna call layer prominence, which is basically a structural metric that tells us, you know, something about how much the structure of the fern has changed as a result of this refreezing um, in 2012. And while we can't directly measure hydraulic properties of the ice sheet um, you know, from radar, this does give us at least a very qualitative initial sort of proxy for you know, the degree to which this melt layer uh, might be an impediment to vertical flow, just because you know, higher densities and more continuous layers will tend to reduce vertical percolation pathways. Um, yeah, so what we see out of sort of this ice sheet scale mapping then um, is there's a couple areas that really stick out sort of the, in the Northwest around Camp Century, and then the Southern Saddle and Southern Dome is having very prominent layering. Then also that this um, you know, melt layer mostly shows up sort of in this transition region between the dry snow zone and shallow percolation zones. Um, you know, not unexpectedly at these higher elevations, we don't um, tend to see the layer um, just because it's pretty low melt even in extreme seasons. But also interestingly, we don't seem to detect this layer in the deep percolation zone, except for some obvious exceptions in the Northwest that I will come back to. Um, you know, and this is interesting in really two things that could be going on here. One is that we're seeing an actual transition in physical processes, right, to sort of um, warmer fern with deeper infiltration, possibly, you know, percolations or temperate ice, things that would sort of prevent us from forming kind of coherent uh, stratified melt layers. Um, the other possibility is that actually this is just sort of a, a failing of the radar system, and in fact, we can't detect them in these regions because there's so much overlying infiltration ice, we don't have this nice density contrast to look for anymore. Um, but one of the exciting things about now having this sort of more ice sheet scale picture is we can start to ask questions about how this relates to sort of the, the general climate and to the weather conditions in 2012 and what that might tell us about the melt layer formation. Um, so what we did was to go and look at sort of spatial correlations between this radar inferred layer prominence and climate variables as simulated by the regional climate model MAR. Um, and at least at the ice sheet scale, we, we found that the one variable that seemed to have a good correlation um, with the layer prominence was actually the standard deviation of daily melt production, you know, which tells us that sort of melt variability on these kind of day to week time scales may be an important um, part of how these melt layers form, uh, possibly because you're getting these sort of rapid freeze thaw cycles that are restricting deep percolation. Um, but interestingly, when we zoom in sort of to a more regional scale, um, what we find is that there's actually as good, if not better correlation with the ratio of the latent heat in the 2012 summer melt production to the integrated fern cold content at the start of that season. But when we look at sort of that ratio and, and how it looks in Northwest Greenland versus Southern Greenland, um, you can see, you know, it's quite different here. And for sort of the same layer prominence, um, we see have about 
you know, half the, the ratio in Northwest Greenland that we do in Southern Greenland. And this is actually pretty well aligned with a, a fairly distinct difference in the radar character of the melt layer that we're also um, observing here. So up in the Northwest in this sort of era of really um, prominent layers around Camp Century, we tend to see a very distinct kind of singular um, subsurface reflector that would be consistent with sort of one um, fairly continuous ice layer. And that's kind of in line with what we've seen from chromocores from that area as well. Um, on the other hand, in the South, we tend to get this kind of one to two meter thick band of bright reflectors that would be more consistent with a conglomeration uh, of many ice layers um, that might be more consistent with sort of more heterogeneous infiltration and refreezing on these, these smaller scales. Um, and again, pretty consistent with, you know, what we would expect from, from field observations from that area. And so, yeah, what this suggests is that even though we're seeing this melt layer um, in many areas across the ice sheet, this kind of stratification and refreezing isn't necessarily being driven by exactly the same mechanisms in every place. Um, and, and putting all of that together with the fact that the really prominent melt layer regions in the Northwest had, had much colder sort of mean annual temperatures, but also much more extreme melt in 2012 than comparative areas in the South. Um, we think part of what's going on here is that the melt layer in the Northwest was probably formed by really unprecedented melt production over otherwise cold fern. Whereas in the South, sort of the past history of melt and the vertical variability in fern density and microstructure that go with that probably played more of a role in sort of retaining um, the, the surface melt near the surface rather than these uh, really sharp thermal gradients like the Northwest. Uh, now, so this is, you know, super interesting that we can say something about sort of the formation conditions, but the other thing, of course, we'd like to look at is, is how is this melt layer evolving, if it is, um, you know, how has this changed since it was initially laid down in 2012? And so we're fortunate enough to have at least a few places where we have repeat radar flight lines um, from both 2013 and 2017, where we can kind of make this comparison on uh, the radar inferred melt layer properties. And so that's what we're looking at here, for an example, transect up in the Northwest, um, where the properties in 2013 are shown in blue, properties from 2017 are shown in red. And basically the takeaway for the Northwest is we don't really see any changes. The, the density has pretty much stayed the same, pretty similar conductivity values. Um, and so this suggests that, you know, up here, the melt layer has pretty much been isolated beneath subsequent accumulation. Uh, but we see a pretty different story in sort of the South and Southwest. And, um, you know, down here, actually, we, we have sort of between 2013, 2017, um, radar inferred increases in density of anywhere between about 50 to 200 kilograms per meter cube, which would really suggest that there's some kind of additional refreezing that's happened sort of in or at this horizon, you know, over that four year period. And that, you know, therefore to some extent that this um, melt layer may be of sufficiently low permeability to kind of restrict vertical percolation past its horizon. Um, and that's kind of consistent with the fact that, you know, this is actually the same area where we, we know and have some greater evidence that there was a prior melt layer that had formed after the fairly extreme melt in the summer of 2010, um, you know, which may have aided the formation of the 2012 melt layer in the first place. Um, and so all of this suggests that there, there's this sort of feedback mechanism where once you have these layers in place, then by restricting um, vertical percolation pathways, they may tend to sort of, um, you know, continue to, to grow and promote the development of these low permeability horizons in the fern. Um, and you can kind of think of this as being very analogous to the Iceland's aggregation mechanism that's been proposed for ice labs, um, except that these interior regions, the thing that's sort of driving this aggregation, the catalyst for that would be these, this sort of single extreme melt season rather than the multi-year excess melt. Um, but where that sort of takes us then is that, you know, when we think about the ice sheet's response to future surface melting, there may be sort of this modulating time scale um, that has to do with the frequency of extreme melt events relative to the rate at which new accumulation could regenerate pore space and fern cold content above that most recent melt layer. You know, and given that we've seen um, five extreme melt events already since 2000, the latest one in 2019 was, you know, pretty close in melt extent to what we saw in 2012. Um, there's maybe a time scale that we really need to be thinking about. And in fact, if we sort of take this question of like evolution, what, you know, comes, comes next from these um, interior melt layers sort of to, maybe the extremes, um, we have a few places where we can look at their kind of down glacier interactions with the downstream refreezing and fern hydrology. And so going back up to the Northwest, this was the one spot where we really did see the melt layers, um, you know, going all the way down to the previously identified ice lab regions. Um, we're lucky to have some really nice ultra wideband radar data that was part of the Hiawatha Crater Survey um, out in the public domain, where we do seem to see sort of the down glacier convergence of the 2010 and 2012 melt layers into this near surface ice body. It's about one to two meters thick. Um, so this spatial connection, you know, definitely suggests that these interior melt layers may be sufficient, although not necessary foundations for the later formation of ice slabs. And similarly, down in the Southeast, um, in the Helheim Glacier area, there's some 
really interesting um, GPR um, data presented by Columbia National in um, 2016 paper showing what, what appeared to be water migrating laterally um, so across some kind of perched ice layer above the body of the main aquifer. And so we actually found that the depth of this perched water table was really consistent with the expected um, and modeled depth of the 2012 layer at the time that that data was collected. Um, you know, suggesting that in these um, higher accumulation regions, melt layers may play a role in sort of helping to build these perched fern aquifers. Um, yeah, so I guess what I would hope that you, you take from this is that this is a really highly hysteretic process. And so, you know, for one, these sort of um, local and seasonal variations in the fern thermal state and the surface melt conditions, as well as the past history of melt, are gonna play a really big role in sort of when and where um, these melt layers form. But once they do form, um, they do tend to, you know, we think reduce vertical percolation pathways. And so, you know, again, under appropriate fern temperature and surface melt conditions, you can kind of encourage further aggregate, ice aggregation at their own horizon. So you get this sort of self-sustaining growth, even the much more moderate subsequent melt seasons that might follow. And so what that leaves us is that the frequency of extreme melt seasons sort of relative to the accumulation rate then may become a pretty important determinant of the fern's multi-year response to surface melt. And you know, certainly I think was a, a good reminder to me that in addition to thinking about sort of what's going on with the, the mean trends in climate, that thinking about sort of the tails of this distribution may also be really important um, you know, to, to our modeling and our predictions about Greenland's um, you know, future surface mass balance. So yeah, thank you so much um, for listening today. Please feel free to reach out to me on email if there's anything you wanna talk about further. Before I go, I've got a quick pitch um, for next week's seminar. So uh, if you got all excited about the radar this week, I definitely recommend you come back next week um, for Dusty Schroeder's talk, um, Paths Forward in uh, Radio Glaciology, where you will get the full overview of all of the cool glaciology questions you can answer with radar. And that's ranging from quantitative analysis of existing data all the way to crazy new radar systems that are getting built in his group. So thank you. Thank you, Riley. Amazing. That was really nice. Um, and I think with that, we are ready to open the floor to any questions. So we had a few questions in the chat already. If you have a question and you want to ask it, uh, maybe raise your hand or just put any, um, uh, you know, kind of reaction button next to your name. Um, but let's start with the questions in the chat. So there have been a few for Maurice. And I think the first one was by Scott. Scott, do you want to ask your question? If you have a microphone, uh, let me just find it. I can just read it out as well. Um, so Maurice, does the enhanced vertical heat flux over rough, rough terrain tend to smooth or roughen the ice surface? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. So thanks for that. Um, well, actually we know that uh, both uh, radiation and turbulent heat fluxes are very variable. Uh, over a few meters in space uh, over a rough surface. So there must be, so the rough, the, the radiation and turbulent heat flux are really shaping the obstacles. But if you come back after one year, the obstacles are still, are still the same. It's just the whole surface has been moved down by three or four meters of ice melt and has been moving 100 meters uh, a year in, with the ice dynamics. But the surface itself really looks the same. And we know that because we have some repeat drone surveys, so we can prove that actually. So I think there's really a compensating effect between the turbulent heat fluxes that must compensate for variable radiation fluxes. But this is just pure speculation. I, uh, I, we are working on that. And, but this is a very interesting topic, of course, because, yeah, why are this, the obstacles not changing after one year? So, yeah. There was a follow-up question by Peter. Did you already answer that as well, partly with your answer right now? Um, let me see. If not, Peter, do you want to unmute yourself and just ask? Or if you have more questions? Yeah, I, I guess, Maurice, it was just to say, so do, do, they, do they really not change? Or do, is it that they, they basically, they are migrating, forgetting ice dynamics, they are individually moving, but their overall proportions remain constant. So, so they're sort of in balance, but gradually moving so that they're, you know, frequency and size distribution remains the same. But I kind of imagine, and, and like you having been up there and that catabatic howling down, I find it kind of, it seems amazing that they can in effect stay constant. I can imagine that they stay constant in shape, but they're kind of migrating with preferential melt, for example, upstream or? 
Yeah, <laughs> well, that's what you would expect indeed. But we had, we put the weather station and stakes there. And I mean, they're not moving. Com and if you compare the really the, the place of where the stakes are with the placement of the obstacles, there's really no, you cannot see from eye that there has been a change uh, after one year. And after, I mean, there has been a lot of melt going on after one year, especially 2019. Yeah. Uh, between 2008 and 2019, we haven't moved the weather station between the, from location and it's still, the area around it is still the same. So it's really counterintuitive, but still there's something that makes that it, these obstacles are not really changing a lot after one year. Maybe over tens of years they are changing, but then the surface has moved maybe two kilometers. So uh, we're not talking about the same uh, ablation anymore. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for that one. Uh, next one would be a question for Lynn. Lawrence, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was a nice talk, Lynn. I was, uh, what I didn't get from your figures was how big the total mass flux change across the grounding line was. There was some units that I couldn't translate in my head quickly enough. Yeah, no, that was a good um, question. So um, I, I ended up just doing the conversion because um, it was about 150 gigatons uh, of change for the most sensitive one uh, over the 25 year period. So on average of five gigatons per year. Um, and the um, annual ice flux across the grounding line is estimated to be about um, 130 gigatons per year. So. Okay, quick follow up on the, on the bed map data, the ice is very thin in the in that area near Ross Island. Um, and you're thinning it then for at two meters a year for 25 years? Um, just two meters. Uh, it's just one, two meters, and then I just solve it. Um, for oh, then you just let it run for the next 25 years. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think there was another question for Lynn from Muhammad. Do you want yes. to meet? Him? Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Lynn. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, my name is Reza. I'm, I'm from University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, I'm a PhD student as well. Uh, we're going to take the same setup uh, like you had with that rover and the radar behind it to Antarctica in the next field season. And I was really interested to know if there was any particular problem that you had with that setup and also, we are at this stage to buy a new sled, and I would like to know what kind of sled that you were using. Okay, that's a good question, and that's exciting that um, you're going to do that field work and using that setup. Um, so, uh, the work that work was collaborative with the Thayer School of Engineering, so I wasn't sort of the go to person on that. Um, if you're interested, um, Laura Ray at um, at, at Dartmouth, uh, Professor Laura Ray um, has students that work on that, and particularly uh, Joshua Elliott and Austin Lines. Uh, their whole PhDs were on um, basically um, making the rovers more efficient and work better um, from all of the field seasons and all the problems that we ran into. Um, one of the problems that we had was with um, turning the rover around. Um, and if we didn't turn it wide enough, um, it would kind of get caught. And there was one instance where it got, I, I think it was just a, a sort of um, hummocky area where it was just really rough and it, one, of the, um, one of the wheels just kind of got stuck and so we had to go out with the helicopter and do that. Um, but I don't remember the specifics of the sled, but if you um, want to email me, I can give you sort of the context of the people who would that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm just checking if we have any questions on Facebook. I don't think so. Um, if I haven't missed it, then I think, uh, oh, Roger, you had a question for Lynn. Yeah. Uh, yes, I did. Thanks very much. Apologies if this sounds awfully like a uh, you know, a Viva type question. Um, I very much like seeing your graph of the uh, the uh, depth discrepancies between your two GPR results and various others. Um, I wonder if you wanted 
if you could expand on the uncertainty bounds you might put on your own estimates for, for reasons other than those two density differences that you mentioned? Yeah, um, that is a good question. Um, trying to see if I can pull up the actual figure. Um, one other uncertainty, um, which I don't really have bounds on exactly, um, is the um, what we assume the dielectric constant to be. Um, and I based that off of um, work by Stephen Arconi, who's done um, quite a bit of GPR in this area, um, in tandem with um, Krell, where they actually have um, some areas where they have um, ground treating where they drill. Um, the uncertainties um, are mostly associated with both the density in the fern and the density uh, in the marine ice. Um, and, um, So changing the density from um, 907 to 936 um, resulted in a change in thickness of only about 10 meters. And um, that's for the marine ice. Um, I don't really have a firm hold on the firm density um, changes, but they are consistent with, I believe they're consistent with what Ben Matt II um, had already done, if that makes sense. It does, thanks. I mean, there's all kinds of other things that we've, it'd be grand to chat about, but we shouldn't delay everybody. Uh, and I'm you know, sorry if I start sounding like a, a thesis examiner here, but uh, really interesting stuff. Great work. Thanks very much. Yeah. Feel free to email me. Um, I'd love to continue the conversation. I will do, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Actually, Riley, yep. I have one for you. Um, I might missed it, but on your graphs, you always show the minimum density. Why do you show, why is why are you interested in the minimum rather than you know the maximum or? Yeah, so this is the perpetual problem of geophysical inversions is that they're, you know, quite underdetermined. And so actually in the case of these sort of reflectivity inversions with ice layers, um, both the thickness of the layer and its like density will have some impact on the reflectivity. And so it's this sort of double parameter space. Um, and you actually get a set of solutions, right, that would all be consistent with the reflectivity we see, but with different densities and different ice layer thicknesses. Um, and unfortunately, the way it sort of spans that parameter space, we can't do much to like actually constrain the thickness. And so for this paper, we sort of made a point to present kind of the most conservative metric out of that, which was like the minimum consistent density, I think to make the point that even though there are these uncertainties in the inversions, even if you take that most conservative metric, uh, it still looks pretty dense and pretty everywhere. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why we um, are using the minimum versus, you know, you could, I suppose, use the average of the maximum or something else as well, but it's because of these sort of this multiple solution space. And that work has already been submitted, it says in text or? Oh well, yeah, and very happy to say it's actually just been very recently accepted. So hopefully we'll be out to the world in maybe the next month or two. We'll see. Nice. Looking forward to read that. Perfect. Cool. Okay. I think we also had a, another question for uh, Maurice by Pete, right? Um, yeah. Okay, I'll be really quick. So Maurice, it was just given the amazing resolution for the roughness that you got from ISAT, do you do you still need to, in effect, model the roughness at the larger scale, or can you just simply take the, the real roughness data from ISAT and just feed that into your melt models? Yes, yeah, so actually what we're doing is uh, we only draw, we draw a line through all these photons, which are a bit irregular in space, and then you need to use a drag model to convert this, this elevation line to aerodynamic roughness. But then basically, if you can do that anywhere, because there's a lot of data and it essentially gives you a map of aerodynamic roughness all over the Greenland ice sheet in essence. And then this is just a matter of uh, forcing this map into a climate model uh, because roughness is, there is, a, is a parameter in these models It's already being used. Usually it's a constant, but now we can also give it a, a, for, a map and calculate melt, so yeah. So it will be sort of in effect, you know, individually prescribed ice, you know, ice sheet yeah. wide for each sort of pixel or whatever. 
Yeah, it would be, uh, well, you have to think about how to do that, of course, but uh, you could uh, prescribe a roughness from this map to every pixel in your model and then individually use the energy balance model to calculate melt everywhere. So I yeah. can't say what the effect is because we haven't tried that yet, but uh, this could have some implications, especially in the rough uh, crevassed areas. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Great, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we got another few questions coming in. One is for Lynn um, from Emily. I'm not sure, do you want to unmute yourself or I can just read it out. Uh, what basal sliding law did you use? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I know um, Emily has used ISSN too. I didn't use the Wertman one. I just used the one built in, but I'm blanking on um, the actual name of the sliding law, but hopefully that'll help answer that. Thank you, that answers that. And we got another one for Riley. Did you have the opportunity to contrast somewhere your ice bridge based results with ground based radar measurements? Yeah, no, we haven't been able to do that, but I think that would be super cool. And definitely if you are field people out there with fern cores or ground based stuff that are also working on this and are like interested in comparisons, please email me or let me know. I would love to chat about that or yeah work with any other data sets that you know are out there to, to look at this in more detail okay thanks okay. and two more for maurice um one is by roger i bet you do well maybe that's not a question i bet you do uh more than just draw a line that's interesting and uh i'm not sure if you have to comment on that um and then another one by uh Lawrence, it might not be a question though. I thought anisotropy was important, but ISAT2 doesn't do a good job, uh, as yeah. good job um, cross tracks. Uh, two great comments. Uh, so you know, of course, it's actually quite complicated and I don't want to bore you with all the technical details of making uh, ISAT2 measurements. It's all in the paper, go check it out. Uh, but uh, it's actually very complicated. And about this anisotropy, yeah, it's, it's an issue because yeah, these ISAT2 tracks, they only go one direction so we don't know what the what you could not estimate uh, the, the dependence on wind direction with isat 2 but i think it's still extremely useful because before that we actually had no clue how rough the surface was and only a few spots where we do where we do field work but greenet is so large that now we actually any glacier we know how rough it is so i think it's still very useful yeah Okay, perfect. Are there any more questions? Okay. Uh, well, that was a really good session. Thank you everybody for joining and thank you to the three um, speakers of today. That was really a uh, really good mix um, and there was lots of um, thank you and applause in the chat. I'm not sure if you saw that. Uh, and Lynn, I think there is one more comment for you in the chat to make sure that you get that. And with that, I think um, all that is left is to close the meeting. Thank you to everybody for joining and um, see you all next week for Dusty's talk. And if anyone is interested in giving an early career scientist talk, then please do get in touch either with me or Tavi and she can just forward, forward these emails. Uh, there are slots available for um, later this summer. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. And just to say that next week, Britain still hasn't changed time zones, so it will be the same time if you already have, and if you change next weekend, it will be at a different time. We'll join you soon in the same time zones again. See you next week. That's because it's not summer here yet, Tavy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should change in July. <laughs> oh, I think that's monsoon, isn't it, rather than summer? Yeah, it is in Edinburgh. See you all next week. Thank you. Bye.